Um, Dr. Don Healy, when I, when I came to the hospital, he was one of the adult mental health center um, sort of more senior level psychologists. He was not a forensic psychologist at the time. And uh, he would supervise me on, um, specifically on a test called the Rorschach, um, which he's pretty good at. Um, and so he, he supervised me on that. And then years later, he joined the forensics team and uh, he would supervise me on um, some of the testing stuff that I did. Um, okay. Know them, we're friends, we all respect each other. Oh, Dr. Browning, um, he came to the hospital after I'd been there a number of years and uh, he started there as a, an MRA School of Medicine um, psychiatry, forensic psychiatry fellow. And so that's how he came to be. He did not work on the same unit as I did. I think he was based in one of the other forensic units, um, but that's how I know him. And okay. Um, there, we have stipulated into evidence a number of volumes of emails and texts. Were you provided with, and phone records, were you provided with those documents? Yes, I was. Were you provided with a transcript from Georgia Tech from the years that Hemi Newman was there? Yes, I was. And were you provided with um, financial data regarding Mr. Newman? Uh, yes, I was. I was provided with um, different types of financial data, uh, mm -hmm. but yes, I was. What other things have you done as part of your forensic evaluation? Pertaining to this case? Pertaining to this case. Did you, did you meet with Mr. Newman? I did. I, I met with Mr. Newman back in uh, 2011, and I also met with Mr. Newman this year. Um, in 2011, I met with him three times. Um, I originally thought it was nine hours. I actually met with him for 12 hours back in 2011. And this year, I met with him twice. On uh, May 31st of this year, I met with him for three and a half hours. And on June 29th, I met with him for three hours. So I've met with him for 18 and a half hours total, one to one. Okay, let me ask you this. Have you interviewed other people besides Mr. Newman gathering information for your evaluation? I did. I interviewed uh, one of his uh, GE uh, colleagues, Adnan Mughal, M-U-G-H-A-L, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him back in 2000, either 11 or 12. Um, and then I've uh, interviewed multiple family members of his, including um, his father, Mark Newman, um, his mother, Rebecca Cohen, his sister, Monique Metch. I've interviewed her twice. Um, his uh, aunt, Lily Newman, I interviewed her this year. A cousin of his, Howell uh, B-I-S-T-R-E, and his wife, and I interviewed um, Hallel Bistre, the cousin, once. No, sorry, twice. And I interviewed uh, his wife one time. Okay. And then you also mentioned you had interviewed um, Dr. Jerkovic. That's correct. Did you try to interview Andrea Snyderman? I wanted to interview her, and I was told that she I'm was. Sustain, rephrase. Were you able to interview her? I was not. How much time, Dr. Flores, would you estimate you've put into this case? I've lost count. I've actually tried sort of figuring it out. Um, if I were to add it all up, I would say at least 200, 220 hours, at least. And is that typical for an evaluation like this? No, it's, it's really extensive much more extensive than, than usually an evaluation takes. Okay. And are you normally paid by the hour? I am. Did you agree to take this case for a flat fee? I did. Um, okay. My rate is $350 an hour, and I agreed to take this one for 20000 this time and 5000 last time. If I were to add up all those hours, it would have been a lot more money. Okay. So have you made money on this case? Objection, Your Honor. What's the objection? Objection's relevance. Sustain. Rephrase. Given the hours you've put in and what were you, you were paid, would you take this case again? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Would she take, I have a question, would she take this case again? Sustain. Okay, I will move on. 
Dr. Flores, have you arrived at an opinion of Hemi's psychiatric diagnosis and his mental state at the time of the shooting um, in November of 2010? Yes, I have. And can you tell the jury what your opinion is as to his psychiatric state? My opinion is that Mr. Newman suffered from undiagnosed and untreated uh, disorder. It's called bipolar one uh, disorder. Um, his episode in 2010 would have been what we call manic with psychosis. And if someone suffers from um, Given his diagnosis, what is his prognosis for the future? Um, as long as he as long as he takes treatment, uh, his mood can be fairly stable. Um, he will be monitoring uh, pretty much forever because the medication that he that he would he benefits from individuals with bipolar disorder, um, the medications that they benefit from, um, it's very important that they be at what we call therapeutic levels. Um, so if it's not the, the amount of medication in his system that he needs, um, he could, what we call decompensate, he could have problems with his mood or his thinking. Um, but as long as he stays on medication, his prognosis can be pretty good, um, and, and he can continue to, to improve. Okay. Um, you've explained, or you've used several terms. Is it important for the, the jury to understand the terminology that relates to this case? It is. I think it's... It's, it's a very, um, it's one of those disorders. It's really difficult to, I think, for a lay person to understand. I think even for psychologists sometimes, the ones that are training, it's just, it's one of those disorders. It's hard to really understand um, unless you really have some education about it. Did you prepare a series of, or have us prepare a series of exhibits on the terminology and the disorders we're talking about? Yes, I did. Your Honor, I would ask to be allowed to um, use those charts. Yes, sir. Let's start with bipolar one disorder. Can you explain the definition of that? Certainly. Um, bipolar one disorder is what typically is known as manic depression. That's typically what people know it. Bipolar disorder is what we call it as clinicians, as official diagnosis, but it's typically known as manic depression, and it is um, it falls under the umbrella of uh, mood disorders. So, with mood disorders, we have depression which is what people are mostly familiar with, somebody that's major depression, suicidal, that kind of thing. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum we have, it's also another mood disorder, it's called mania. So, so when somebody's manic, um, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then we have bipolar disorder, and all three of those are, are uh, mood disorders. They all fall under the umbrella of mood disorders. So with manic depression or bipolar disorder, um, what it means is that there is a shift in mood from... Um, from up to low, um, and that there is a variation between. In other words, you don't go from being really, really, really depressed and suicidal necessarily to being completely the opposite, crawling out of your skin, jumping off chairs, that kind of thing. It doesn't necessarily go like that. Can it go like that? Yes. But most of the time, the shift is not as severe, um, but it can be that severe. Okay. Um, let me bring you back to the chart. Um, on the chart, it refers to the DSM-4. Can you explain to the jury what that is? Sure. The DSM-4 is uh, the diagnostic tool that we use uh, in mental health, uh, whether you're a social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist. We use, it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, at the time that I evaluated Mr. Newman, it was in the fourth edition. Um, it has now uh, gone to the fifth edition, um, but the uh, 
this is one of the disorders that it, only a, a few disorders changed in terms of classification and, and diagnosis. This is one of the sor disorders that remain the same whether you were evaluating it in 2011 or whether you're evaluating it in 2016 exactly the same criteria. So what the DSM does is it gives us an explanation of each specific disorder, in this case bipolar 1 disorder. It tells us um, what the disease would look like, what the disease is, and then it gives us specific um, symptoms that the person must meet for a specified period of time in order to meet the diagnostic criteria. So with, uh, with bipolar disorder, we have a combination of individuals experiencing what we call depressive episodes and also what we call hypomanic or manic episodes. So uh, for the, um, the depressive episode, um, there's a list of eight different symptoms, and the individual must only have five of those symptoms present for a two-week period um, in order for us to put a check mark as meets that criteria. And then when we look at the, um, the manic piece, which is sort of the more high energy, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, with that one, there are also eight criteria, and the individual only has to have three of those, and those have to have persisted only for one week. So you're not expecting to see these symptoms prolonged. Can they be prolonged? Yes. There are individuals that can stay in a either hypomanic or manic period or a depressive episode for weeks or even months, especially if they go untreated. Um, but all we need is for, in the case of mania, for three symptoms out of eight to be present for one week for us to put the check mark and says they meet that criteria. And then for the depressive episode, a two-week period where five out of the eight criteria must be met. So when I talk about criteria and symptoms, with, uh, with a depressive episode, those are probably the symptoms that most people are familiar with when we talk about depression. So with a depressive episode, the, um, the eight symptoms out of which five would have to be met are um, the individual for that two-week period of time is in a depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. Um, they are showing a diminished interest or pleasure in activities, things that they usually wanted to do, enjoy doing. They're just not showing an interest in it. They're not, they're not doing it. Um, there, there could be a, um, a shift in weight. Uh, some people, when they are experiencing a depressive episode, they gain weight, and some people lose weight. Uh, they lose appetite. Um, there is uh, what we call disrupted sleep. And with sleep, just like weight, it can go either up or down. So some people, when they are depressed, they want to sleep their life away. We call that hypersomnia. And some people experience insomnia, where they can't they can't sleep. Um, they have trouble falling asleep, or they have trouble uh, staying asleep, or both. Um, a, a fifth one would be what we call a psychomotor agitation or retardation, and that basically means um, just kind of slowed, you're kind of slowed, or agitation is some anxiousness. Um, a sixth symptom would be uh, feeling tired, feeling loss of energy. A seventh symptom would be the individual, when they are in an expressive, uh, ep depressive episode, they are expressing feelings of worthlessness or feelings of uh, lots of excessive guilt, feeling guilty about something. Um, and then the eighth is that there is some impact or can be some impact in their ability to concentrate and to focus. So those are the eight, um, and like I said, out of those, five of those would have to be met for two weeks in order for somebody to meet that part of the criteria for bipolar disorder. With the um, manic episode, what we have is the mood is, is very different from when they're in a depressive episode. So if they're experiencing a hypomanic or a manic, manic episode, um, they are um, one of the one of the symptoms that you often see in somebody with that level of mood is they will appear very grandiose. Their self-esteem would be very inflated. Um, they think they can do it all. They know it all. Um, they have maybe special powers that people other people don't have. Um, so very very uh, huge sense of self. That's called grandiosity. So that's one of the one of the core symptoms that can be present. Another one is one of the very classic ones that we tend to see um, in most people when they are in a manic episode is there is what's called decreased need for sleep. These are individuals that um, they don't need to sleep. They don't, feel, they don't feel tired. They can sleep two, three hours. They can go, some people can go two, three days in a row without any sleep. 
and they're waking up refreshed. They're not waking up tired. And they're not, not going to sleep, not because they can't sleep. It's because they don't have a need for sleep. They have so much energy. So that is one of the core symptoms. Another one is they will appear more talkative than usual, um, uh, or they'll just kind of want to keep talking. Um, sometimes you see what's called racing thoughts. Not always, but sometimes individuals can have what's called racing thoughts where um, they may be thinking of something, they're speaking it, and then another thought comes in, and then they're speaking that. So sometimes, with, sometimes if they're experiencing that particular symptom, it can be um, difficult to follow what they're saying because they're just jumping, flight of ideas, jumping from topic to topic. Um, they, uh, fifth one is they appear very, uh, dis they can appear distractible. Um, uh, uh, one that we, we tend to see almost in everybody with, uh, with a manic or hypomanic episode is uh, what we call increase in goal-directed activity. That means they are able to do a lot of whatever they put their mind to. So um, whether it's at work, at work they are doing a lot more than they've ever undertaken and they're doing it well because they've got the energy to do it. Um, socially, we see individuals when they're experience, experiencing this type of episode, um, they will become much less disinhibited um, because of the talking and the increase in goal-directed activity and so they will actually be um, talking about stuff that they usually wouldn't talk about. If, they're, if the individual, for example, is shy, um, when they are in this type of mood, they're not going to appear shy. They are going to be very social, very gregarious. Um, the filter will be, um, there won't be a filter. They'll be talking about things that ordinarily they wouldn't talk about because they're much less disinhibited. Um, sexually, um, I, I, this, uh, we tend to see, we, we can see what we call hypersexuality. This is, again, increase in goal-directed activity. So what you see is that um, the, the, you'll see lots more periods of, um, there's a much higher level need for sex. And so individuals will masturbate um, and, or they'll do it at a higher <laughs> frequency than they usually do. Um, or they will have, um, sometimes they'll present with just having sex indiscriminately with people that they ordinarily wouldn't have sex with or unprotected sex. Um, <coughs> Hyper-religiosity, um, when, when their interest in that type of mood becomes religion, um, you will see sometimes what we call hyper-religiosity, where they're really focused on religion. Um, and um, they may come to believe things um, that, that um, from their studies that, that after they come off the mood episode, it doesn't make sense anymore, but at that time it makes sense to them. Um, they can uh, sometimes engage in, in some risky uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, for example, uh, we will have uh, individuals who will gamble when they're in that type of mood. And, and they're not gamblers, or they will um, spend money, or they will buy stuff that they don't need. And I'm not talking about one thing. I'm talking about excessive stuff that they don't need um, just because that's the mood that they were in. Um, and then afterward, oftentimes, they come to regret it because sometimes they couldn't afford it, and they have all this stuff that they bought during a manic episode. Um, and the eighth one is... Um, that if they are in a manic episode, it can cause a severe impairment in, in their ability to function in the world. Um, but there's also part of there where it says, and sometimes, not always, they have to be hospitalized, depending on what the, the, um, the symptoms are. Um, and sometimes they can become what we call psychotic. And my opinion is that, that is what happened with Mr. Newman, that he became psychotic. And um, at, at the time right around when... Mr. Snyderman was shot up. So you know, August, September, October, November, was Hemi showing symptoms of either, consistently showing symptoms of either mania or depression? Uh, for the period of time that you just specified, that summer to November, um, I think there's ample evidence, in my opinion, that there's indication that he was experiencing some of these manic episodes, but his very primary symptom out of those eight would have been the psychosis. It would have been that he was delusional. Okay. Now you um, talked about the, the range from mania to depression. Mm -hmm. 
depression. And I, this is a chart that you put together. Can you explain how this is important? Sure. Um, this chart is from Mayo Clinic. I want to give them credit. I think it's a really good one. Um, so what we have in the middle, in the green, is um, normal balance mood. And that is where most of us will want to be, to really be at our best, sort of more normal functioning, more predictive functioning. Um, what we have here is we have a range of mood that can go, if we go down, I'm sorry, I've never used one of these things, so it's a little weird. If we go down, um, it can go from normal mood, where you're not experiencing these symptoms that I just said, any of the depressive symptoms or any of the manic episodes. You're just kind of regular. Um, and you can shift. And what happens with bipolar disorder is there can be a trigger. So something can trigger it, but not necessarily. The mood shifts can also just happen because it is a chemical disorder. That's why it responds really well to medication. And that's why we try to treat individuals with bipolar disorder, not so much with talk therapy, but with medication because it is a chemical disorder. And so the, the shifts can change from one moment to the next, it can change. And it can go from normal mood to you can have a little bit of depression. So maybe one or two of those depressive um, symptoms that I, that I named, or maybe they have several of those symptoms, but they're, they're mild. Maybe they have some insomnia, but it isn't every day. Maybe they just have you know, a day here and there where they can't sleep because they're preoccupied. Maybe their mood is a little low, but they're not suicidal. Um, so they can experience a mild or moderate depression. If the depression gets to severe depression, that is where we would see, we would likely see more of those lists of symptoms that, that I spoke about and or the severity would be higher. So this is where you will see more insomnia. The mood is going to be lower than, if it, than up here. Um, they may experience, this is where you would see um, suicidality. This is, somebody, this is where you would see somebody saying that they're having thoughts about killing themselves because they feel worthless and that nobody loves them and what's the point in being here. If we go up, we have something similar happen, but the mood is sort of the opposite. So we have hypomania and mania. So again, if we think of all of those symptoms that I went through for a manic or hypomanic episode, the individual will have some of this. So they might have a decreased need for sleep. Maybe they're sleeping five hours instead of eight, and they're still feeling refreshed. Um, or maybe they are uh, doing a little bit more at work, and they are doing it well. Um, or they just seem a little happier, go lucky. Um, and that would be more mild to moderate. Severe over here would be where their symptoms are such that they're, again, they're either more severe or they've got more of those symptoms and they're more severe. And it can impact their functioning. It can impact their functioning to the point that some individuals do have to be hospitalized because they're, they become a risk to themselves or to others at that point. Um, their individuals can get very irritable when they're in a very manic state. And so, for example, at the hospital, when somebody requires hospitalization with bipolar disorder, it's because either they are suicidal, they're way down here in severe depression, or they are up here and um, we will see individuals that have become violent because their irritability is so high. Um, and so uh, it, it can impact their functioning. Um, but again, as I said earlier, or, and I believe this is the case with Mr. Newman, or they become psychotic. And according to the DSM, once somebody has developed psychosis, um, automatically that puts them at, they, they have, Psychosis, in terms of bipolar disorder, makes it mania. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've been going about an hour with this. This is the Deputy Garrett. This is your uh, morning uh, break. Deputy Garrett, uh, this uh, have back in the box in 10 minutes from now, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you.